we will now move on to restrict our set of markets that we're looking at. So same as uh, in the same way that we solved Arrow's theorem, in the same way that we solved Jabbar Satterthwaite paradox, uh, there all our problems stem from the case that we were trying to capture too much. We were trying to find a mechanism that would always work, but maybe we could find a mechanism that would work in a narrower case, but would work better than, than not working at all. And in particular, we will look back at the problem of, as they call it, item allocation. So again, our running example will be a single one. Before we had this running example of uh, a marriage market where we match men to women, but once again, the interpretation was not necessarily binding, so you could have a lot of other markets that you could fit into that description. For example, matching firms and workers, matching uh, consultants within a project, matching inputs and outputs in production, and so on. We talked a lot about them last week. Now we turn back to our favorite problem in mechanism design. We will say we still have two sides, but on one side we have players, people, economic agents, on the other side, we have items, so boxes with something in them, something known, actually. So it's not that it's not the case that, that something is unknown. And we want to find, again, the same kind of matching, the same kind of marriage or one-to-one -one allocation. But how is it different from the matching problem, from the marriage market, from the marriage example that we had here? Is there any aspect of the setting that would be different from what we talked about before? Items don't have preferences, or at least that's what we would like to think. In this example, we would only really have preferences on the one side of the market. So we only need to extract players' preferences for items. We do not need to extract items' preferences for players. And this is the model that we will look at. In particular, we will have a look at two kinds of models. So later, I hope today, we will look at the case when there are no preferences whatsoever on one side of the market. But before that, we will say that there are some common preferences on this side of the market, on the side of the items. Squiggle X. And what is the way to interpret that, uh, that, that preference? So this slide just gives you the same setup of the marriage market that we already know, with the only difference that objects now have common preferences over players, and the designer knows this preference. So, but the designer does not know players' preferences. As usual, our concept is still stability, because we try to find something else other than stability, and we kind of failed. Or, or I told you that we would fail, but it's maybe too difficult to be reasonable. So let's stick with stability. How do we allocate things across people? How do we allocate rooms in a dormitory across students? How do we allocate students among schools? Let's first ask the question of what is this preference exactly? What is this squiggle with an X under it? How can we interpret it? On the one hand, you can interpret this as literal preferences of the agents on this side of the, of the market. So it would still make sense, so long as we assume that it, it is a single for all agents uh, on this side of the market and known by the principle. An example of that is exactly school choice. So once we are thinking of how to allocate, for example, high school graduates to colleges, to universities, if there is some single state exam that we can use to measure kind of the goodness of a student, then it is very reasonable to assume that all universities would like to have good students with high exam scores, and uh, all universities would be similarly unhappy to have uh, worse students. So this would fit this model quite nicely. There would be this preference, 
it would also be known by the designer in the sense that we do not need to extract it from, from the set of the market. This is one interpretation that we can have. Another interpretation is that this is not actually preference of this side of the market. These are not preferences of the schools or of the items that we are allocating. But this is the preference of the designer over players. So maybe there is some priority over whom the designer likes more, who is at the top of this ranking and should thus get a better item here, or something like that. In this problem, we can find a very easy solution. In fact, we already know what the solution is. Since we already know preferences of one side of the market and we only need to extract preferences from the other side of the market, we have a mechanism that does that. And this is the deferred acceptance mechanism. So we allow players or our agents to propose two items, basically. And we can say that this, uh, if we then implement the, the stable matching generated by this algorithm, by a player proposing deferred acceptance algorithm, it would be optimal, it would be actually a dominant strategy for these players to report uh, their preferences truthfully. This is something we talked about last week. One thing to say here is that a deferred acceptance would actually look even easier, even simpler in this particular model than it did before. So instead of saying that, okay, in round one, all players send their um, tokens to items, then items select their favorite token, return the rest, and so on. So instead of this way, we can run it in an, in an alternative way, but arrive to the same outcome. In particular, we can run a basically priority auction, you can say, even though there are no prices. But basically, we can say, well, who is the top player in this preference? Let them select their favorite item. So let's say we start with player one. Player one likes item two best. Just give them this. Then ask the next player, player two, the next player in this preference. What is their favorite item among those that is left? So there is no longer item two, but there is still item three, so player two would get that. And so on. Allow all players to select their favorite item in turns. This would be the deferred acceptance outcome. You can check that in your own time. Just pick some example with some preferences, run the two, and verify that the you arrive to the same outcome. So what's the problem here? The problem is we know that if there are many stable matchings, then we are selecting the worst among them for according to this preference uh, X. So it's probably we do not really care if it's a school choice. It is probably reasonable to put students' interests above those of the institutions. But if we're interpreting this as a designer's preference across players, so designer would like to favor some players and not others, then what we know is that the outcome that we generated is the worst stable outcome for the designer. Ideally, what the designer would want to do is uh, to run deferred acceptance from the other side of the market. Let items choose the players. That's a problem. It's, it's a smaller one than total non-existence of a good mechanism, but it's still a problem. So we have one mechanism that works, but we are afraid that it does not work well enough, that maybe we can do better. That we are finding stable matching, but maybe there is a better stable matching. The truth is, it's not a problem, in fact. So we do not really care about the fact that we are selecting the worst of stable matchings because there is just one stable matching. If one side of the market has common preferences, then the stable matching is indeed unique, meaning that our algorithm works as well as it can. It does indeed select the unique stable matching, which is by the definition, our favorite stable matching as the designer. So, this is pretty much the bottom line. 
if you have this kind of problem, if you, uh, if either the designer or you have preferences over agents, or you know the preferences of one side of the market and they are common, then you can use deferred acceptance to get the unique stable matching. Any questions on this? Perfect. Then let's move on to the second version of this model in which we do not have any kind of preference on this side of the market. Which means that but we could still run this kind of deferred acceptance, the priority choice rule. The question is what kind of priority can do we choose? What if we want to treat everyone fairly and we do not want to favor some agents and disfavor the others? What can we do then? The question is basically what kind of this priority rule do we choose? And one fair way to choose it is to choose it at random. So if we pull this priority rule out of the bag, or if just at every point in time we select we run a lottery among the remaining players to decide which of them selects next, that this would be quote unquote fair in in this undefined sense of fairness that I have in mind, but that I have not made this ex explicit. But it's true that the other way is to let players sort this out on, the on their own. So to define the model, we now look again at the same model with no priority list uh, like this. I erase it. And this takes us beyond the standard marriage model indeed. Meaning that one way in which you can interpret, interpret this is to say that all items are perfectly indifferent between all players. The reason that this is beyond the marriage model is that in standard marriage model requires that all players have strict preferences for just technical reasons because otherwise all those millions of beautiful results break down. So we kind of have this total indifference on one side and we want to do something that's kind of fair. Another thing that we will assume for now is there is some initial matching mu zero. So we can think of it as, again, we allocated items initially at random. Or maybe players came to us having some initial matching and they asked us to rematch them in an optimal way. And that's what we do. So the algorithm that we can use here is another algorithm that is quite popular in matching literature and in matching applications. So I wanted you to be familiar with that. It is called top trading cycles. And the, the idea of it is, is, is simple. So it's the same as in, as in everywhere else. So like when you, were, when you were talking about Nash equilibrium in your game theory class, you probably mentioned that one way to arrive to a Nash equilibrium in this just finite uh, normal form game is to start from a random strategy profile and to iteratively select best responses. Say this player, where would player one, how would player one like to change direction from here? They would like to select this action. How would player two react to that? They would select this action. So if you converge somewhere, that would be a Nash equilibrium. When we are talking about deferred acceptance, we said that this, mecha, this solution works there too. We want to find a matching in which there are no blocking pairs. So we can just start with a random matching and iteratively satisfy blocking pairs. That worked. That would bring us to a stable matching. In this problem, our goal is basically to have no Pareto improving, trans, uh, Pareto improving trades. Meaning, basically, our blocking pairs are now not between player and item, right? Because our items are completely indifferent between all players. They do not care, they do not care who are they with, so we will have no blocking pairs in the standard sense. Any matching would be stable. But we can have blocking pairs among different players. They can say, well, there's player one, there's player two. They are both unhappy with the items they got, but they can swap items and both would be happier. We would like to eliminate that option. So we would like to select a matching which admits no Pareto improving trades. 
meaning it would already be Pareto optimal. And the way to do that is the same. We just iteratively trade. We say, we take a random matching. Does it have any Pareto improving trades? If it yes, go ahead, trade. Do you have any other Pareto improving trades after that? Maybe. If yes, trade. If no, we are done. And this is the big idea behind top trading cycles. The only non-trivial part is that you might have not just bilateral trades, so two people in a kind of blocking pair, but you can have a blocking circle, a set of agents such that if I give my item to you, you give your item to the next one, and then I myself receive the item from the last one, all of us together would be happier, at least weekly happier. And this is exactly the way that this uh, algorithm proceeds. So we have some initial matching. Then we pick any player and we ask that player to point to their favorite item. Then the person who possesses that item gets the next choice. So that person would get to point to somewhere else. So let's say we have seven player players with seven items, right? We say, well, okay, you get to choose first. Who has your currently favorite item? Let's say this dude has the item that I like the most. Then you say, okay, you now have the power to choose. Who has your favorite item? They say, okay, maybe this dude. And we proceed in this way until we find a loop. So in this case, uh, this person pointed to this item. So it's got the same favorite item as the person we started with. In that case, we have a closed closed loop of trades. And we trade in this circle. Meaning that this person gets this item, this person gets this item, this person gets this item. Now, every one of them has their absolute favorite item right? because that's the question that we ask them in that they will never want to trade anymore there is nothing in the market that they like more so what we can do is we can let them go they are of no low, no more use to the mechanism we say that these are the items that those three people got so now we are left with four people, and we do the same thing again. We just generate these circles until there are no more left. So for example, our graph looks something like this, 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 and this person can point towards themselves. Yeah, if person already has their favorite item, we also let them go, right? So we can release this person. And eventually, in this way, we will release everybody from the mechanism. So they will get their favorite item among those that's left. That's the bottom line. That's the top trading cycles mechanism. It is not really any better than the deferred acceptance mechanism with random priority, because it also hinges on those, on basically the random order in which you select players to point towards their favorite items. There's actually one property in which stop trading cycles algorithm is better, which is in this model, it is not only incentive compatible and Pareto optimal, like the deferred acceptance mechanism was before it, but also it takes into account the initial matching mu zero. So if you have this initial matching that you started with, and if you say that, well, every player can say at any point in the mechanism, well, that's bullcrap, I'm taking the item that I came with and I'm leaving. This is their outside option. If we say that this is an option for, for people, we want our mechanism to be incentive compatible relative to that initial allocation. And top trading cycles achieve that. So it is a little bit better than deferred acceptance in this respect. But the main reason I wanted to cover it is because it is just a algorithm that's sometimes used, often used, and it's an algorithm that you can use as well if you ever need to. Then to conclude, in the item allocation problem, 
If you have any kind of priority, you can use uh, priority across players with the, with the information. Uh, you should probably use deferred acceptance. If you do not have this priority, but you have some initial allocation that you care about, and that is the outside option for players, then you should use stop trading cycles. If you have neither of these two, you can use either one mechanism, either deferred acceptance or top chain cycles, and both would work fine. If you have both, so you have both some initial allocation and you have some priority role across players, then I don't know. So you can try both if they give you the same outcome. It's fine. If they don't, you're in trouble because there might not be any any single uh, allocation that would be stable in that setting. Stable and Pareto optimal in that case, in the setting. The common misconception about matching models is that it's all about you know selecting the allocation, selecting the matching, and there is no place for money in it. There is no place for transfers. There is no place for trans for Prices, transfers. I, I thought I had something else to say. But this is not necessarily the case. Yeah. Because some of the problems that we talked about actually do have money in those. Item allocation problem might have money. That, that's how we treated it for most of this course. Uh, the problem of uh, job markets, where we allocate workers across firms, that has money. The problem of allocating assets across firms that might as well have money. Why not? Even if we're talking about departments of a single firm, there are you know, payments within multinational firms. That's an incredibly fascinating topic in accounting. So yeah, few know that you can actually do matching with money. And I'll show you one example of how that works. And uh, what we will see is that nothing really changes. You already know that the, the algorithm that's best, and that algorithm is deferred acceptance. So we had a small break from that, talking about top training cycles. But really, if there is a, anything that works about matching, then it's deferred acceptance. So if you have a matching problem, you should try that. If deferred acceptance failed, then you can say that's impossible, more or less. So the setting that we'll be working is we're working with is as follows. Again, wall of text. Let's try to uh, draw that. Firm one, firm two, and boat three. Uh, they all have number of players number of workers in the market one two three four five and we will actually not be looking at marriage model in the sense that we will allow many to one matching we will go even further and we will allow that any single firm can hire any number of, uh, of uh, workers so it might as well be the case that firm one hires everyone in the market in this model. The way preferences work here is for any link between firm I and worker J, we care about, we have three values to care about. Firstly, we have uh, sigma J, which is worker I's disutility from working for firm J. I guess the indices go the other way around. So firm J, worker I. The way to interpret the sigma is this is the minimal wage at which this worker will agree to work for this firm. And so this already gives us the second primitive we want to care about, which is the wage. And we will call SIJ the, the wage that is currently being negotiated between these two players. Finally, there should be some profit from some benefit from hiring these people, and we call Y I J as the marginal product that worker I brings to firm J. 
and we will say that the firm's total profit is just linear. So it's sum over all layers of yij of the marginal product minus the wage. So there are no synergies between different workers. There are no complementarities. And there are no substitutabilities either. It's not the case that different workers can do the same job. No, they are all unique flowers with their own unique talent. You can think of it as, um, as these are artisans, or maybe, yeah, these are music producers, artists, and these are music labels. Music labels do not maybe give that many synergies uh, across different producers. They just take a cut from every, every artist's work. Right? That's probably the best example here. But in general, this kind of uh, profit structure, profit function structure, is extremely restrictive. Because, well, you can see in general you can have substitutability, in general you can have complementarities. So we can relax this utility function just a tiny little bit, but not by much. Machine models really do not like those kind of uh, preferences that go beyond the people that are directly involved in matching or the entities that are directly involved in matching. And further, one non-trivial assumption that we will make is that all the monetary terms are integers. Just to avoid, you know, overbidding by epsilon, we'll say that there is some smallest unit of count. And if you are outbidding the other, some other firm for this worker, you must increase your bid by one kroner, one dollar, one, one whatever. Cool. And this all is a model by Kelson Crawford from 1982. So as I advertised, the algorithm that would solve this problem, that would yield the stable matching in this problem, is deferred acceptance, with only minor modifications. So the way it works here is that we have parallel negotiations between all firms and all workers. So th there will be a lot of emails floating around. In the beginning, let's put all wages at zero. Let's say all firms tell all workers what is, would you be willing to work for me at wage zero? Workers would probably say no, unless they have negative sigmas, negative costs of working for a firm. They, they are ready to work for free, which is how internships work, right? So maybe some uh, offers would be taken, some offers would be rejected. Now, this is one round of this deferred acceptance algorithm. And the sigmas are commonly known? The sigmas are commonly known, yes, and y's are commonly known. Yeah, so we are back to our version zero of the model where everybody knows everything. We're just trying to find a stable matching. Good question, thank you. So if a given worker, uh, yeah, the non-trivial non thing is that if a given worker receives many offers from many different firms, they, as usual, keep one, at most one, and reject the others. Now, this is how one round proceeds in this model. In the next round, all firms send new offers to all workers, except for those offers that were not rejected in the previous period. And these new offers are exactly the same, except they offer a wage that is one dollar higher. So you're not willing to work for me for free. Would you do it for one dollar? Right? And so then all workers now receive all the new offers. They say, no, I'm not willing to work for you for one dollar. Or, okay, maybe now I reject that other offer that I had before and I will hold on to this offer. Right? So this continues, the wages continue to rise until all workers hold on to all offers, so the firms basically do not need to make further offers. It might also be the case that the worker rejected wage which was at yij, meaning that the wage that the firm is supposed to offer to this worker is now above the marginal product that the worker would bring to the firm, which means it's not worth hiring that person for this firm, 
So those negotiations also start. And then we continue to run this mechanism until, again, um, no new offers are made, like in deferred acceptance algorithm. So the bottom line, the, the outcome of this mechanism is that it will produce a stable matching uh, in the sense that there will be no blocking pairs in the usual uh, sense of Gale and Shapley. The cool thing about this mechanism yeah, is that the resulting matching is not only stable, but it's also efficient. It will be surplus maximizing. It's not obvious from the mechanism itself, but if you look at it closer, uh, you will kind of see it. I will not even tell you any more about it. So I'll just state this as a fact. The resulting allocation will be efficient. Every worker will be matched to the firm where the difference between marginal product and the marginal cost of work for this firm is the maximal. So you can see that when we include money, we have to make some modification to our algorithm, but it does not really change that much. Otherwise, this is the same marriage problem that we had before. All the same results pretty much still apply. So in particular, the results about incentive compatibility of this algorithm as a game still holds. So for the firms, it would be good. It would be the best stable matching that they can get if everyone plays according to their true preferences. For the workers, it would not be optimal. So they could have profitable deviations uh, they, this, this game would not be incentive compatible for them, meaning that it's true. If workers were strategic, they would indeed reject all offers until they are extracting all surplus from the firm. But once again, we are treating this as an algorithm, yeah. not, as, not as an actual game. So we're thinking that this is the designer sitting in his room playing toy, toy soldiers, toy workers and toy firms. Uh, running this algorithm and then implementing it. So let's try to take this algorithm and apply it to the problem of item allocation. Uh, meaning we need to modify this model in such a way that these are not workers, but these are items. And these can be firms or people or whoever you want. So now it's not exactly the same item allocation problem that we had before because we are now looking at many to one matchings. So we allow one person to have to get many items, but it's just basically a multi unit auction that we're running now. So one difference is that every person can have many items. The other difference is that there are money involved. So we're not just matching people with money with items. Um, agents will have to pay for the items like wage in the Kelsey Crawford model, but you can think that this wage goes to the designer and this is the actual price of the item. In that case, you can think of sigmas, so the costs of working for the firm as maybe the outside options, the, the reservation uh, values of every item, but for simplicity, let's just set them all to zero, right? No wages. Then what the algorithm that we just saw reduces to is a single English auction. So basically for every, in every round, all agents would say, are you willing to pay zero dollars for this item? If yes, send the offer. If no, just tell us and we will exclude you from the auction, right? Then for one dollar, who would be still willing to get that item and so on. And we raise the price until all but one uh, player drops out. All players but one drop out. This is exactly the English auction, and we know it by other name by now, the VCG mechanism. And this is this tiny little point of tangency between matching literature and the mechanism design. So you see that we started from very different paths, but we converged in the end to the same thing that we that we always have in, in mechanism design. 
so this was these two weeks were a big preview for matching literature i hope you learned something from this again this was just a taste of this textbook by Rothman Sotomayor. If you're interested in learning more, have a look at it. One more topic that we need to cover. Dynamic matching. It's as bad as dynamic mechanisms are. Your mind can explode. So I will just give you a quick spoiler of what happens there. This is where kind of most uh, of the action is happening today. Or not most, but a lot of action is happening today. Uh, dynamic matching mechanisms, where basically the, the dynamics comes from agents on both sides arriving at the market over time. So you do not have everyone in the market at the same time, but for example, buyers come to the item over time, sellers come to the market over time, they can stay or for some time, or maybe they just come and go immediately. And the question is how to match these two sides together in this dynamic world. So should you wait to accumulate enough on both sides of the market, which would be costly for, for players, because who likes waiting? But then you would be able to always set up a better matching. Or should you just kind of uh, do this greedy algorithm and say, well, the best matching that I can give you right now as you came, is this one. So you should take this one, right? Match as you go. Okay, this is the other option. And uh, this is basically the main trade-off in this literature. Do you value good matches more, or do you want to make fast matches or quick matches? And one paper, for example, that uh, does this is this paper by Bakara, Lee, and Yarif. And I, I, I wanted to look at it before today, but I didn't have the time. I believe the optimal matching mechanism that they have in their model, which I have not even introduced, but you get the idea of what it is. The optimal matching mechanism there is to accumulate uh, the market, is to accumulate offers from on both sides for some time, and then clear the market at once. So you do not do the greedy uh, algorithm. You do not give a deadline to every player saying, you know, I will give you, I will try to match you best within the next hour or two. And then if there's nothing, then I'll do something else. No, you set up kind of a, in financial terms, frequent batch auctions. Basically, play, players are submitting their bids over some period of time, like minutes, an hour or so. And then when the deadline hits, when the bell rings, the auction is run and the market is cleared. So then, maybe if you want, you can submit another offer in the next period for the next auction, and then the market is cleared again. So, this is kind of the idea behind dynamic matching models. And this is also the extent to which we will talk about dynamic matching models. Because I think you have suffered enough of dynamics for one course. Next week, we will begin talking about information design, meaning we will see in the mechanism design so far, we assume that players have some information and we try to find a way to extract information from these players. And information design is a relatively recent field that asks kind of the opposite question. What information can we give to the players if we want them to play in a particular way in order to in order for them to play in a way that's optimal for us.